59 is the 12th of September and this is the 54th time I'm speaking on the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta. Tonight we come to Sutta 130, Deva Dutta Sutta, the Divine Messengers. This Sutta is a bit similar to the previous Sutta. We read uh, the Bala Pandita Sutta where there's a description of hell. Also, this sutta talks about five deva messengers. There is a slightly similar sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya 3.35. There they talk about three deva messengers. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, another in Deeker's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, noble sir, they replied. The Blessed One said, Monks, Suppose there were two houses with doors and a man with good sight standing there between them, saw people going in and coming out and passing to and fro. So too with the divine eye or heavenly eye, which is purified and surpasses the human. I see beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. I understand how beings pass on according to their actions thus. These worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right views in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a happy destination, even in the heavenly world. Or these worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right views in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared among human beings. But these worthy beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech and mind, revilers of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong views in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in the realm of ghosts, or these worthy beings who were ill-conducted, etc., on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in the animal world, or these worthy beings who were ill-conducted, etc., on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So, you can see from here, huh, when the Buddha talks about Destinations of rebirth uh, in the early suttas, the, the Buddha always talks about five destinations. Uh, the Pali word is gati, uh, G-A-T-I. Uh, later books uh, like the Mahayana Sutras uh, and the Abhidhamma, they talk about six destinations of rebirth. Uh, they have added one more, the Asura uh, realm uh, in the woeful plains. Uh, but we have seen in the Diga Nikaya, it is mentioned that uh, all uh, asuras uh, uh, are heavenly beings. Uh, uh, they are not in the woeful planes of existence. Uh. So here you can see among these five uh, destinations of rebirth, uh, two are happy destinations, uh, the heavenly world and human uh, world, uh, and three woeful destinations of rebirth, uh, the ghost realm, animal realm, and hell realm. Uh. Now the wardens of hell seize such a being by the arms and present him to King Yama, saying, Sire, this man has ill-treated his mother, ill-treated his father, ill-treated recluses, ill-treated Brahmins. He has had no respect for the elders of his clan. Let the king order his punishment. Sorry for a moment. This is about a man who has fallen into hell, taken rebirth in hell. Then King Yama presses and questions and cross-questions him about the first divine messenger. Good man, did you not see the first divine messenger or deva messenger to appear in the world? He says, I did not remember, sir. Then King Yama says, good man, have you never seen in the world a young tender infant lying prone, fouled in his own excrement and urine? He says, I have remember, sir. Then King Yama says, good man, did it never occur to you, an intelligent and mature man? I too am subject to birth. I am not exempt from birth. Surely I had better do good by body, speech and mind. He says, I was unable, venerable sir, I was negligent. Then King Yama says, good man, 
through negligence you have failed to do good by body, speech and mind, certainly they will deal with you according to your negligence. But this evil action of yours was not done by your mother or your father, or by your brother or your sister, or by your friends and companions, or by your kinsmen and relatives, or by recluses and brahmins, or by gods. This evil action was done by you yourself, and you yourself will experience its result. Stop here for a moment. So here, when a person goes down to hell, King Yama probably first tells him all the evil deeds he has done, or reminds him of all the evil deeds he has done that caused him to fall into hell, and then told him, why didn't you heed the warning that we gave you? And here the Sutta talks about five Deva messengers, heavenly messengers. The first one is a baby. Then the so when we see a baby, uh, we should know uh, there's a uh, rebirth, uh, that we are subject to rebirth, uh, unless you have become uh, the Arahan. Uh, so, so this uh, evil action uh, was due to negligence. Uh, a lot of people, uh, because we don't know the Dhamma, or we don't bother much about the Dhamma, then we are careless, uh, careless uh, to do good, careless uh, and do evil deeds. Uh, so, uh, because of that, now we have to suffer. Uh. Then after pressing and questioning and cross-questioning him about the first divine messenger, King Yama presses and questions and cross-questions him about the second divine messenger. Good man, did you not see in this, the second divine messenger to appear in the world? He says, I did not remember, sir. And King Yama says, good man, have you never seen in the world a man or a woman at 80, 90 or 100 years, aged, as crooked as a roof bracket, doubled up, supported by a walking stick, tottering, frail, youth gone, teeth broken, grey hair, scanty hair, bald, wrinkled, with limbs all blotchy? He says, I have, humble sir. Then King Yama says, good man, did it never occur to you, an intelligent and mature man, I too am subject to aging. I am not exempt from aging. Surely I had better do good by body, speech and mind. He says, I was unable, venerable sir, I was negligent. Then King Yama says, good man, through negligence you have failed to do good by body, speech and mind. Certainly they will deal with you according to your negligence. But this evil action of yours was not done by your mother or your father, etc. This evil action was done by you yourself and you yourself will experience its result. Then, after pressing and questioning and cross-questioning him about the second divine messenger, King Yama presses and questions and cross-questions him about the third divine messenger. Good man, did you not see the third divine messenger to appear in the world? He says, I did not, Venerable Sir. Then King Yama says, Good man, have you never seen in the world a man or a woman afflicted, suffering and gravely ill? lying foul in his own excrement and urine, lifted up by some and set down by others. He says, I have, humble sir. And King Yama says, Good man, did it never occur to you, an intelligent and mature man? I too am subject to sickness. I am not exempt from sickness. Surely I had better do good by body, speech and mind. He says, I was unable, humble sir, I was negligent. And King Yama says, Good man, through negligence, you have failed to do good by body, speech and mind. Certainly, they will deal with you according to your negligence. But this evil action of yours was not done by your mother or your father, etc. This evil action was done by you yourself, and you yourself will experience its result. Then after pressing and questioning and cross-questioning him about the third divine messenger, King Yama presses and questions and cross-questions him about the fourth divine messenger. Good man, did you not see the fourth divine messenger to appear in the world? He says, I did not, venerable sir. Then King Yama says, Good man, have you never seen in the world when a robber culprit is caught, kings have many kinds of tortures inflicted on him, having him flogged with whips, etc., uh, as all the kinds of uh, punishment, uh, as mentioned previously uh, in the previous sutta, uh, and having his head cut off with a sword, 
he says, I have, Venerable Sir. And King Yama says, Good man, did it never occur to you, an intelligent and mature man, those who do evil actions have such tortures of various kinds inflicted on them here and now. So what in the hereafter? Surely I had better do good by body, speech and mind. He says, I was unable, Venerable Sir, I was negligent. Then King Yama says, Good man, through negligence you have failed to do good by body, speech and mind. Certainly they will deal with you according to your negligence. But this evil action of yours was not done by your mother or your father or your relatives, etc. This evil action was done by you yourself and you yourself will experience its result. Then after pressing and questioning and cross-questioning him about the fourth divine messenger, King Yama presses and questions and cross-questions him about the fifth divine messenger. Good man, did you not see the fifth divine messenger to appear in the world? He says, I did not, remember, sir. Then King Yama says, Good man, have you never seen in the world a man or a woman, one day dead, two days dead, three days dead, bloated, livid, and oozing with matter? He says, I have, Venerable Sir. And King Yama says, Good man, did it never occur to you, an intelligent and mature man? I too am subject to death. I am not exempt from death. Surely I had better do good by body, speech, and mind. He says, I was unable, Venerable Sir, I was negligent. And King Yama says, Good man, through negligence you have failed to do good by body, speech, and mind. Certainly they will deal with you according to your negligence. But this evil action of yours was not done by your mother or your father or your relatives or your friends, etc. This evil action was done by you yourself, and you yourself will experience its result. Stop here for a moment. So here King Yama tells him that five divine messengers have already sent, they have already sent to him to give him warning, but he did not take heed. The first one is a baby. Just seeing a baby, eh? King Yama says, eh, you should know eh, that you will be reborn like, like everybody else. And then the second one is an old man or old woman, eh, uh, tottering, frail, teeth broken or no teeth, scanty head or bald, wrinkle, limbs all blotchy. Eh? Uh, so when you see an old person, eh, we should also know that one day all of us have to be old like that. And the third one is somebody sick, like somebody with cancer and lying in the bed, cannot get up, lying found in their own excrement and urine. And people have to lift you up, set you down, give you food, wipe you clean, etc. And we see this, uh, we also should know uh, one day, uh, without fail, uh, every one of us uh, will one day have to be like that uh, when we are old enough. Uh, then uh, the fourth divine messenger uh, is when somebody does wrong, uh, he is caught by the king uh, and tortured uh, in all kinds of torture. Uh. So King Yama says, uh, if you can see uh, uh, beings tortured here and now, uh, you should expect la, that in the next world also, uh, uh, beings who do wrong uh, will be tortured. Uh, so you should have been careful. Uh. And the fifth one uh, is a corpse. La. Uh, if you see a corpse, uh, dead, bloated, livid, oozing with matter, uh, you should know la, every single one of us, uh, one day, uh, will become the body will become a corpse. Uh, and also sooner than you, you, you realize. Uh, uh, so, we should uh, be prepared for it. Then after pressing and questioning and cross-questioning him about the fifth divine messenger, King Yama is silent. Now the wardens of hell torture him with a five-fold transfixing. They drive a red-hot iron stake through one arm. They drive a red-hot iron stake through the other arm. They drive a red-hot iron stake through one leg. They drive a red-hot iron stake through the other leg. They drive a red-hot iron stake through his chest. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Next, the wardens of hell throw him down and pair him with axes. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. 
Next the wardens of hell set him with his feet up and his head down and pair him with adzes. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Next the wardens of hell harness him to a chariot and drive him back and forth across burning ground, blazing and glowing. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Next the wardens of hell make him climb up and down a great mound of burning coals, blazing and glowing. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Next the wardens of hell take him feet up and head down and plunge him into a red hot metal cauldron, burning, blazing and glowing. He is cooked there in a swirl of froth. As he is being cooked there in a swirl of froth, he is swept now up, now down, and now across. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Next the wardens of hell throw him into the great hell. Now as to that great hell monks, it has four corners and is built with four doors, one set in each side walled up with iron all around and shut in with an iron roof. Its floor as well is made of iron and heated till it glows with fire. The range is a full hundred leagues or a thousand kilometers, which it covers all pervasively. Stop here for a moment. So the description up to here is just like the previous sutta. But here on, there's a more detailed description, uh, which is quite frightening. Now the flames that surge from the great hell's eastern wall dash against its western wall. The flames that surge out from its western wall dash against its eastern wall. The flames that surge out from its northern wall dash against its southern wall. The flames that surge out from its southern wall dash against its northern wall. The flames that dash out from the bottom dash up against the top, and the flames that surge out from the top dash against the bottom. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings, yet he does not die as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Stop here for a moment. So this great hell, which is a thousand kilometers in length, in breadth, and in height, and all the walls are iron, the flames are so strong, it can go from one wall uh, to the opposite wall, uh, 1,000 kilometers away. Uh, so you imagine uh, the flame is so great, uh, how hot it is. Uh. So this being, once you fall into the great hell, uh, you'll be wandering around, uh, trying to get out uh, of this great hell, uh, and you're being burned all the time. Sometime or other monks, at the end of a long period, there comes an occasion when the great hell's eastern door is open. He runs towards it, treading quickly. As he does so, his outer skin burns, his inner skin burns, his flesh burns, his sinews burn, his bones turn to smoke, and it is the same when his foot is uplifted. When at long last he reaches the door, then it is shut. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings, yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted his result. Some time or other at the end of a long period, there comes an occasion when the great hell's western door is open. The same thing happens. Eh? When its northern door is open, when its southern door is open, he runs towards it, treading quickly. Uh, the description is as before. When at long last he reaches the door, then it is shut. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die, so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Sometime or other monks, at the end of a long period, there comes an occasion where the great hell's eastern door is open. He runs towards it, treading quickly. As he does so, his outer skin burns, his inner skin burns, his flesh burns, his sinews burn, his bones turn to smoke, and it is the same when his foot is uplifted. He comes out by that door. I'll stop here for a moment. So, I don't know how long uh, he is in this great hell, uh, but maybe like once a year, uh, the door of the hell, uh, there are four doors uh, in the north, south, east and west. Uh, so maybe once in a year, uh, the door opens. Uh, so when he sees the door open, uh, he has great hopes of getting out of that hell. Uh, so he rushes uh, 
towards the open door. And then because the length uh, of each uh, length of breath uh, is a thousand kilometers, uh, so he might be maybe a few hundred kilometers from the door, then he runs. Uh, as he runs, uh, he is burned. And even the bones uh, turn to smoke. Uh, uh, and in spite of the pain, uh, he keeps running. Uh, he hopes to get out. Uh. By the time he reaches, uh, maybe after a few hours, uh, when he's close to the door, uh, the door closes. Uh. So imagine uh, the pain uh, that he feels, the physical pain and the mental torture uh, uh, that he feels uh, so near to escape and yet uh, could not get out. Then he has to wait for a long time, uh, maybe another year or two years uh, before the, another door opens again. And the same thing happens. Uh, uh, so this happens for I don't know how many years. Uh. Finally, one day uh, he managed to get out of that hell. Uh. Immediately next to the great hell is the vast hell of excrement. He falls into that. In that hell of excrement, needle-mouthed creatures bore through his outer skin and bore through his inner skin and bore through his flesh and bore through his sinews and bore through his bones and devour his marrow. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Immediately next to the hell of excrement is the vast hell of hot embers. He falls into that. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die, so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Immediately next to the hell of hot embers is the vast wood of Simbali trees, a league high, that means a 10 kilometers high, bristling with thorns, 16 finger breadths long burning, blazing, and glowing. They make him climb up and down those trees. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Immediately next to the wood of Simbali trees is a vast wood of sword leaf trees. He goes into that. The leaves stirred by the wind cut off his hands and cut off his feet and cut off his hands and feet. They cut off his ears and cut off his nose and cut off his ears and nose. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted his result. I'll stop here for a moment. So just now this guy was in the great hell. And after many years he managed to run out of the great hell. As soon as he gets out of the great hell, he falls into another hell. It's the hell of excrement where it's like a shit pot, it's fallen into a big shit pot and it's swimming about there in the shit and there's these creatures a bit similar to our this leeches but this is much worse, it's like a worm swimming in the shit and then he has this needle-like thing that pokes through the skin and pokes through the flesh uh, and can even bore through the, to the bones uh, and then it sucks the bone marrow. Uh. Uh, then you can imagine uh, it's so painful uh, and probably itchy at the same time. Uh, and he cannot get rid of them. He's swimming about uh, in the shit uh, and they all attack him. Uh. Uh. And after many years, uh, he managed to swim out of it. Uh. He falls into this hell of hot embers. Uh. There he's burned by all these uh, burning embers. Uh. Uh. Uh, even though he is burned by all these burning embers, uh, he has to get up and try to struggle to get out of it. Uh, I don't know how long, how many years uh, he's in that hell of hot embers, uh, running here and there trying to find a path out uh, or a door out of that hell. Uh. Finally, after many years, uh, he gets out of that hell and then he falls into in a wood of symboly trees. Uh. This uh, forest uh, with these uh, trees uh, that are one, uh, that are 10 kilometers high. Uh. These trees are 10 kilometers high and they have thorns uh, 16 inches long, more than one foot long. And he's made uh, to climb up and down those trees. Uh. For many years, uh, he's made to climb up and down the trees. Uh. He's, he's poked all the time uh, and it, the, the hell is also blazing and glowing, uh, so hot. Uh. Uh, 
and the thorns are also blazing and glowing. Uh, then uh, one day when the hell guardians uh, uh, are a bit careless, uh, he managed to run out of the wood. Uh, then he goes into another hell uh, called the wood of sword leaf trees. Uh, slightly different, another type of forest. Uh, and the, uh, the trees there uh, have leaves uh, which are extremely sharp. Uh, uh, so as he tries to run out of that forest, uh, he goes here, he goes there, looking for a way out of this forest, uh, and the leaves will cut him, uh, cut his hands, cut his feet, cut his ears and nose, uh, and he's bleeding all the time. Uh, and he's in great pain, uh, yet he has to keep rushing, uh, afraid of being caught by other beings, uh, hell beings. Uh, so he keeps, he's like a fugitive, uh, running here and there, uh, trying to get out of the hell. Uh. Immediately next to the wood of salt leaf trees is a great river of caustic river of water. He falls into that. There he is swept upstream and he is swept downstream and he is swept upstream and downstream. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Next the wardens of hell pull him out with a hook, setting him on the ground. They ask him, good man, what do you want? He says, I'm hungry, Venerable Sirs. Then the wardens of hell prize open his mouth with red hot iron tongs, burning, blazing and glowing. And they throw into his mouth a red hot metal ball, burning, blazing and glowing. It burns his lips, it burns his mouth, it burns his throat, it burns his stomach. And it passes, passes out below, carrying with it his large and small intestines. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Next the waters of hell, hell asks him, Good man, what do you want? He says, I am thirsty, venerable sirs. Then the waters of hell prize open his mouth with red hot iron tongs, burning, blazing and glowing. And they pour into his mouth molten copper, burning, blazing and glowing. It burns his lips, it burns his mouth, it burns his throat, it burns his stomach and it passes out below, carrying with it his large and small intestines. There he feels painful, racking, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil action has not exhausted its result. Then the wardens of hell throw him back again into the great hell. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So now after the hell called the wood of salt leaf trees, uh, he managed to get out of it, uh, and he fell into a river, a big river of caustic water. This caustic water is like acid. So uh, he has to swim here and there. Uh, imagine even if you fall in there and you don't know how to swim, uh, uh, you have to learn to swim. Uh, so he swept upstream and swept downstream uh, and he's burned all the time. Uh. So uh, if he's not a good swimmer, then he will swallow some of that acid into his mouth uh, and it will burn him also. Uh. And he tries to get out of the river, but it's a huge river. It takes him some time before he can swim out of it. But the river is always sweeping him up and down the river. So it might take even a few years before he managed to get out of the river and onto the dry bank. But then he's caught by these wardens of hell and they ask him, what do you want? And he says he's hungry. That time I can imagine he's exhausted. He is in great pain, is mentally uh, exhausted, so blur blur. Lah. So, and they ask him what you want. Lah. He doesn't think lah. Uh, they might torture him. Lah. He just says what he feels, lah, which is, and he's feeling hungry. Lah. One thing, there's a sutta where the Buddha says, lah, all beings lah, need food, lah. whether you're heavenly beings, or human beings, or ghosts or animals, or hell beings, uh, every being uh, needs food uh, to survive. Uh. So this fellow is hungry and exhausted and so in great pain uh, and um, mentally exhausted, so blur blur. Uh. So he just says he's hungry. Uh. Then they pry open his mouth uh, and throw uh, a red hot metal ball into it. Uh which burns his uh, intestines uh, and comes out uh, carrying the intestine with it. Uh, and he is in great pain. Uh. 
Then the wardens of hell ask him again, what do you want? And then again, uh, blur, blur, uh, it just says what he feels, uh, namely he's thirsty. Uh. Then they pry open his mouth again uh, and pour this molten copper, uh, uh, which is burning uh, into him, and uh, the same thing happens. Uh. Then uh, they catch him uh, and throw him back into the great hell. So you see he's gone one round. Uh. Uh, he's hoping to get out of one hell, now he goes into the, another hell. And getting up, wants to get out of that hell, he goes into another hell. It goes one cycle, finally he goes back to the great hell again. So you man, imagine, uh, he has so much uh, physical uh, suffering uh, and mental suffering. It has happened that King Yama thought, those in the world who do evil, unwholesome actions, indeed all have these many kinds of tortures inflicted on them. Oh, that I might attain the human state, that a Tathagata, Arahan, Samasambuddha might appear in the world, that I might wait on that Blessed One, that that Blessed One might teach me the Dhamma, and that I might come to understand that Blessed One's Dhamma. Monks, I tell you this not as something I heard from another recluse or Brahmin. I tell you this as something that I have actually known, seen and discovered by myself. That is what the Blessed One said. When the Sublime One had said that, the teacher said further, Though warned by the divine messengers, full many are the negligent, and people may sorrow long indeed, once gone down to the lower world. But when by the divine messengers, good people here in this life are warned, they do not dwell in ignorance, but practice well the noble Dhamma. Clinging they look upon with fear, for it produces birth and death. By not clinging or attachment, they are free in the destruction of birth and death. They dwell in bliss, for they are safe and reach Nibbana here and now. They are beyond all fear and hate. They have escaped all suffering. So this last part, the Buddha says, even this King Yama, he, having seen so much torture in the hell, he knows uh, about other realms of rebirth, uh, so he also hoped uh, that one day uh, he would get a human body, uh, because in the human realm, uh, human realm is one of the few realms uh, where you can learn the Dhamma, and the human realm uh, is the only realm uh, where you can strive uh, to get out of samsara. Uh, the other one where you can hear the Dhamma uh, is the uh, heavenly realm. Uh, heavenly realm, but usually they have to come down to the human realm to hear the Dhamma. Or there might be some Devas or Devis uh, who, could, who can teach the Dhamma. Uh, but then in heaven, uh, they have no inclination to strive uh, because they don't see suffering. It's only the human realm. Uh, we see our lifespan is so short, uh, so we see impermanence. So there's an urgency to strive. Uh, uh. So you see, uh, King Yama also uh, hopes uh, that one day he can get the human body, learn the Dhamma, understand the Dhamma and become an Arya so that he's on his way out of samsara. So the Buddha says, uh, every one of us, uh, we have been in samsara for so long uh, that we have practically uh, uh, been reborn uh, in every realm of existence uh, except uh, the Sudhavasa heavens, uh, which only the Anagamin, the third fruit uh, Arya is reborn. Uh, so because we have been reborn in so many realms, so many times, uh, I'm sure uh, in the past probably uh, when we were suffering uh, either in hell or suffering as a ghost, uh, we, we probably had this wish uh, that one day uh, we might get the human body and get the chance to hear the Dhamma so that we can get out of the round of rebirths. Uh. Today we have this wish come true. Uh, and we have the chance to hear the real, original teachings of a Buddha, a Samasambuddha, and we have a human body. And this is the best thing that we can, the best chance that we can get in existence. And if we don't make use of it and become an Arya in this life, the Buddha said there is the perfection of the fool come across so hard to come across the Dhamma and we don't take this opportunity, uh, we take it lightly. Uh. A lot of people are like that because their mind is blur blur, uh. they don't see the consequences, uh. they, take, they take things lightly. Uh.
And then sooner than they realize, uh, death will come, uh, the cold finger of death uh, will come and touch them on their shoulder. Uh, then they, they, they regret uh, when they had the chance to practice. Uh, uh, I always like to, to remind you, uh, a few years ago, we had one man, he came here, he did a retreat of two weeks, uh, after that he left, uh, didn't come back. And it was only four years later he came back. And when he came back four years later, uh, his face was dark. And I asked him what happened. He said he has cancer, he has terminal cancer. Uh, then he came all the way uh, to tell me uh, that he regretted very, very much. Uh, I regret, extremely regretted uh, that he did not come back again uh, to practice here uh, because he already, he already had terminal cancer. So after that he left here. Two weeks later he passed away. Uh, so you see, a lot of people are like that. Uh, when you have the chance uh, to practice the Dhamma, you take it lightly. Uh, uh, sooner than you realize, uh, death will come and touch you. Okay, now we come to Sutta 131, Bade Karata Sutta. This, this is one of the chants we do uh, in our Pali chanting. Uh. Here is translated as one fortunate attachment. Uh. This Bade Karata consists of three words. Uh. Bada, Bada, here is this Bade also, Bada. Bada means auspicious, uh, happy, uh, fortunate. Uh. Uh, even can be used as venerable uh, for somebody uh, who is uh, fortunate, somebody who is auspicious, uh, can be called venerable. Eka is one. one. Rata or rati uh, means red or infatuated or attached. Uh, so here it translates as one fortunate attachment. Uh, but there's another famous monk called Venerable Nyana Nanda. Uh, and he translates this Bade uh, Karata as the ideal lover of solitude. Bada, uh, he translates as ideal. Ekarata, he translates uh, as attached to Eka. Eka is one, solitude. Uh, so, uh, somebody who's attached to solitude, uh, lover of solitude. So, he calls it the ideal lover of solitude. Uh, it's quite a good translation also. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Rebel Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, I shall teach you the summary and exposition of one who has one fortunate attachment. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Rebel Sir, the monks replied. The Blessed One said, Let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes. These two sentences uh, literally uh, can be said to be, let not a person run back to the past or live in expectation of the future. For the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him see each presently arisen state. Let him know that and be sure of it, invincibly, unshakably. Today the effort must be made. Tomorrow death may come. Who knows? No bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away. But one who dwells thus ardently, relentlessly, by day, by night, it is he, the peaceful sage has said, who has one fortunate attachment. Or, it is he, the peaceful sage has said, uh, who is the ideal lover of solitude. Uh, uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha says uh, we should not run back to the past uh, and we should not live in expectation of the future. Uh. Many people, uh, we tend to be the worrying type. Uh. Uh, so we tend to worry about the future, what has not happened. Uh. We keep planning for the future. Uh. And then some people uh, are always gone, run back to the past. Uh. Sometimes they regret certain things that happened in the past or a broken love affair or something. They keep thinking, thinking, thinking. And uh, they are not in the present. Uh, what the Buddha says, uh, the past has been left behind. The future has not been reached. Uh. Let him see uh, each presently arisen state. Uh. See the present. Uh. Know and be sure of it. Uh. 
and the effort must be made today uh, because tomorrow death may come. Uh, so one who dwells uh, diligently, uh, relentlessly, day and night, uh, uh, seeing the present, uh, is called one who has one fortunate attachment uh, or the ideal lover of solitude. Uh. So this uh, fortunate attachment, uh, this attachment, uh, the uh, what does it mean? Uh, it means uh, attachment to cultivating the holy life. Uh, he has a lucky attachment. Uh, it's not a bad attachment. Uh, it's a good attachment. Uh, the attachment uh, to uh, practice, uh, to day and night, uh, to practice uh, diligently. Uh, so it's, it's also an attachment, but it's a good attachment. How monks does one revive the past? Thinking I had such material form or body in the past, one finds delight in that. Thinking I had such feeling in the past, or I had such perception in the past, or I had such volition in the past, or I had such consciousness in the past, one finds delight in that. That is how one revives the past. And how, monks, does one not revive the past? Thinking I had such material form in the past, one does not find delight in that. Thinking I had such feeling in the past, or I had such perception in the past, or I had such volition in the past, or I had such consciousness in the past, one does not find delight in that. That is how one does not revive the past. And how, monks, does one build up hope upon the future? Thinking I may thinking I may have such material form in the future, one finds delight in that. Thinking I may have such feeling in the future, I may have such perceptions, I may have such volition, I may have such consciousness in the future, one finds delight in that. That is how one builds up hope upon the future. And how monks does one not build up hope upon the future? Thinking I may have such material form in the future, one does not find delight in that. Thinking I may have such feeling, we have such perception, volition, consciousness in the future. One does not find delight in that. That is how one does not build up hope upon the future. So here the Buddha says uh, that uh, uh, not to revive the past uh, is not to think about your past five aggregates. Uh, the five aggregates that we take to be I or mind, uh, body and mind and uh, it's also body, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. Uh, so if you don't take delight in that, uh, then you don't keep thinking about it. Uh, and also, uh, uh, similarly with the future, uh, uh, don't think, don't build up hopes. Uh, there are some people uh, hoping uh, that they'll be reborn in heaven uh, uh, with a beautiful body, and with psychic powers and all these things. Uh, so there's building up hope for the future. Uh, so if you don't uh, take delight uh, in the past or the future, uh, then you tend not to think so much of it. Uh. And how monks is one vanquished or overcome in regard to presently arisen states? Here monks, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, regards material form as self or self as possessed of material form or material form as in self or self as in material form. Similarly, he regards feeling, perception, volition, consciousness as self or belonging to self or the self as in the aggregates, or the aggregates as in the self. That is how one is vanquished in regard to presently arisen states. Stop here for a moment. So presently arisen states refers here to the five aggregates. Just now that saying by the Buddha, instead with insight let him see each presently arisen state. Let him know that and be sure of it invincibly, unshakably. Uh, so this here, the Buddha explains uh, that uh, presently arisen states refers to the five aggregates. Uh. So when you are vanquished uh, or overcome uh, uh, by the presently arisen states, uh, uh, means uh, that you take the five aggregates uh, as the self uh, or as belonging to the self. Uh 
or the self as in the five aggregates or the five aggregates as in the self. Uh, so you have this identity view. Uh, you, you take the five aggregates, uh, you identify yourself with the five aggregates. Uh, uh, so that is being vanquished uh, in regard to presently arisen states. And how monks is one invincible in regard to presently arisen states? Here monks, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, does not regard material form as self, or self as possessed of material form, or material form as in the self, or self as in material form. Similarly, he does not regard feeling, perception, volition, consciousness as self, or self as possessed of the aggregates, or the aggregates as in the self, or self as in the aggregates. That is how one is invincible in regard to presently arisen states. Let not a person revive the past, or on the future build his hopes, for the past has been left behind, and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him see each presently arisen state. Let him know that and be sure of it, invincibly, unshakably. Today the effort must be made. Tomorrow death may come, who knows? No bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away. But one who dwells thus ardently, relentlessly, by day, by night, this he, the, peace, the peaceful sage, has said, who has one fortunate attachment. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Monks, I shall teach you the summary and exposition of one who has one fortunate attachment. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So basically what the Buddha uh, explains here is that we should not think about the five, the, the, the past, our past in regard to ourself, which is the five aggregates, and we should not uh, build up hopes for the future. And we should uh, not identify ourselves uh, with the five aggregates. Uh. If you don't identify yourself with the five aggregates, uh, then you are uh, invincible uh, in regard to presently arisen states. Uh. Uh. Also, in other suttas, the Buddha says, uh, not only that, uh, we have to uh, examine the five aggregates uh, and see how they are impermanent how they are dependent on so many conditions and those conditions itself are impermanent. So that's why our five aggregates are even more impermanent. So don't uh, attach to it. If we attach to it, we are going to suffer. The next sutta is quite short because it's basically the same as this one. So I'll go through it. 132. Ananda Bade Karata Sutta. Ananda and one fortunate attachment. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jesus Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. Now, on that occasion, the Venerable Ananda was instructing, urging, rousing and encouraging the monks with talk on the Dhamma in the assembly hall. He was reciting the summary and exposition of one who has one fortunate attachment. Then in the evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and went to the assembly hall. He sat down on a seat made ready and asked the monks, Monks, who has been instructing, urging, rousing and encouraging the monks with talk on the Dhamma in the assembly hall? Who has been reciting the summary and exposition of one who has one fortunate attachment? It was the Venerable Ananda, Venerable Sir. Then the Blessed One asked the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, how were you instructing, urging, rousing and encouraging the monks with talk on the Dhamma and reciting the summary and exposition of one who has one fortunate attachment? I was doing so thus, Venerable Sir. Let not a person revive the past, etc. And he repeated the whole of the last sutta uh, up to one who has one fortunate attachment. I was instructing, urging, rousing, and encouraging the monks to talk on the Dhamma thus, and reciting the summary and exposition of one who has one fortunate attachment thus. Good, good, Ananda. It is good that you were instructing, urging, rousing, and encouraging the monks to talk on the Dhamma thus and reciting the summary and exposition of one who has one fortunate attachment thus. Uh, then the Buddha repeated the whole 
Sutta as before. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this Sutta is basically the same as the previous Sutta, just that it's spoken by Ananda. Uh, I think we can stop here. Um, the next Sutta is also quite similar. The next two Suttas also is the Adikrata Sutta. Uh, we'll do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Anything to discuss? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Person uh, who does uh, a lot of evil uh, will fall into hell. Uh. A person who does evil and uh, not to such a uh, great degree uh, will be born in the animal realm. Animal realm is also a lot of suffering uh, because you eat each other, uh, tear each other up alive. You know? When you are alive, uh, people, some other creature eating your flesh. How do you, uh, that's why you look into the animal world, uh, all the creatures are all very nervous. Uh, very nervous, always frightened, always looking here and there. Uh. So these two uh, are uh, very um, undesirable places of evil. It is stated somewhere in the suttas that uh, when a person is in hell, uh, he will remember you know, what he did that made him uh, come to hell today. Na. He does remember. So if you look into the world, na, look in the newspapers and all that, you see a lot of people uh, doing evil actions, uh, but they don't really know, uh, the, the, they don't realize uh, that it is evil. Uh. For example, there are some people, uh, they uh, uh, kill these wild exotic animals, either they smuggle them or they kill them because some people like to eat their flesh uh, and all these things and they, 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 they think uh, that uh, God made these creatures for you to eat so there's nothing wrong in killing them. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, when they go to hell one day, then they will realize. Uh, the last time I read somewhere in the papers that uh, somebody in Hong Kong or in China, they keep this bear, this big bear, you know, and they tap the what the bile or something from this bear, mm. and this bear is every day is in pain and crying out. Uh, and this fellow is tapping when he feels he wants some bile, he take the bile from this animal. And there are some people they want to eat the brains of the monkey. And they just cut off the uh, top of the monkey's head and scoop up the brain when the monkey is still alive. Imagine, uh, he will get that now uh, when he goes to hell. Same thing will happen to him. How, how long he has to experience that in hell. Uh. My personal view uh, is that uh, it's very, um, it's just below our, it's 
just below our conscious, uh, our normal consciousness. Uh, in other words, uh, it's in our subconsciousness, uh, but not far away. Uh. So uh, that's why there are some people, uh, you ask them to do certain things, uh, they dare not do. For example, to, to kill a chicken, uh, they dare not do because probably in the past they have suffered for it. Uh. Or some people, there's a there's a ample opportunity uh, to uh, commit adultery and all that. They dare not do. Uh, so all these things uh, probably uh, is, is something from the past uh, that makes them... Uh, React like that. Uh. When, when the last uh, couple of times we've discussed in 2022, you know, when the person emerges to help, when all the, uh, when he has exhausted the uh, results of all his previous giving actions, when he comes up from that way, he's not really busy, he stays. There is no, uh, there is no standard uh, when a person comes out of hell. Uh, it depends on his, uh, uh, his past karma. Uh, there are some uh, after coming out from hell, uh, they might be reborn in the animal realm because they, 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 they lack the good karma. On the other hand, somebody like Mahamogalana, he was Mara in his previous life, and because he um, did a lot of evil karma towards the past Buddha. And the Arahans, uh, he f fell into hell. But after suffering for something like 100,000 years in hell, uh, he came out and took a human rebirth. And then from there became an Arahan. So there is no fix. Each person is different, completely different. There is no standard. Because our karma is all, all different. But in the previous sutta we read last night, the Buddha says, uh, generally, uh, if a uh, person can go to hell, uh, he's a perfect fool, uh, the Buddha says. Uh. Uh, so being a perfect fool, uh, when he comes out from hell, uh, even he takes a human rebirth, uh, he will be a very unlucky person. He'll be born misshapen, ugly, difficult to uh, to earn his living and all these things. Uh. No luck, a uh, person with no luck. Because if a person can be such a fool uh, as to create so evil karma, uh, and a little, little good he has done. Okay, concerning this uh, trauma, here when you look at uh, the last few years in the uh, the US declare war in uh, Iraq, yeah. President George Bush quit in Islam. He sent his people in. And a lot of people were killed. A lot of Americans and lots of Indians were killed. In that sort of situation, who bears the worst karma? Is it the soldiers who were sent into the battleground where by the whole to shoot? Or is it the commander in chief who said, oh, that's what I want you to do, we're going to go in there, you're going to bomb us before they can kill us? I think possibly the heaviest karma is the people who decided that there should be war. And then, uh, Oh, definitely, because uh, once you uh, know the Dhamma, then you change your character. It's very important to change our character. Once you change your character, then uh, the, uh, the, the Buddha says, uh, not all karma will ripen. Uh, the, if you do a lot of uh, good deeds, uh, then it kind of cover the uh, evil karma. It's only the heaviest karma that will ripen first. Uh, so, you generally, uh, if you have not come across the Dhamma, most of us uh, in our younger days, uh, we did a lot of uh, bad karma. La, but it's not really serious. La. For example, uh, when we are young, we may go fishing uh, and uh, uh, other things. La. Uh, but... Uh, 
because it was done out of ignorance uh, and also um, I mean the, the the intention is very important if your intention uh, is to make somebody suffer uh, then the karma is very heavy uh, but your intention is not to make somebody suffer then it's not so heavy uh. so don't don't worry about uh, the past karma what is important uh, is uh, now, whatever uh, good we can do, uh, we do. Uh, and the greatest good we can do uh, is in the spiritual path. You see, I always say uh, that when we come across the Dhamma, I tell lay people, uh, there are a few things you can do. Uh, one is uh, practice generosity. Then after that, practice sila, moral pandam. And after that, listen to the Dhamma. And after that, uh, meditate. And after that, change your character. These five things, uh, the easiest to do uh, is charity, dana. But because it is the easiest to do, uh, the merit is the least. Uh. Merit is the least. Uh. Harder to do uh, is keeping your precepts. Uh, because it's harder to do, is more meritorious. And then the third one, uh, listening to the Dhamma, gives you wisdom. So, uh, uh, is more meritorious and uh, meditation uh, is also very difficult to do also very meritorious and then the hardest to do is to change your character for the better uh, that is the highest uh, most meritorious so the last three uh, listening to the Dhamma meditate, meditating uh, and improving your character uh, this is what in Chinese we call Kong Te Kong Te Kong take a spiritual merit that brings you out of samsara. Uh, is a uh, uh, spiritual merit uh, that that uh, helps you on the on the uh, on on the path out of uh, samsara into nibbana. Whereas the first two, uh, generosity uh, or charity uh, and sila, moral conduct, uh, is worldly merit. Worldly merit that when you come back, uh, you get a better rebirth. Uh, you get a a, a happier life, la, a, you get, you know, a, a good life, la, lucky, fortunate life. La. So these five things, la, remember. lucky that um, you you woke up a lot of people don't wake up as you heard about one man he used to go hunting and uh, he shot a monkey the monkey fell and uh, the, it was a female monkey with a baby and because of the baby I think uh, the, the the monkey uh, like um, bowed to him out to him uh, because of the baby uh, and he saw that after that he hung up his gun. Mm. Um, 
maybe, but uh, there are two types of persons uh, who go up to heaven. The Buddha says uh, there's a putujana, an ordinary person who does not know the Dhamma. He goes up to heaven, uh, and after that, uh, when he passes away, uh, he may come down to the woeful plains of rebirth. Uh. But the Buddha says, uh, uh, Aryan disciple of the Buddha who has learned the Dhamma, one who has obtained right view, uh, if you go up to heaven, uh, you come down, the lowest you can get is the human realm. You will never be born into woeful plains. Uh. So you just shuttle between heaven and the human realm uh, uh, until you enter Nibbana. Uh. So you are not wasting your time uh, in heaven. Uh. It's a rest, rest period, uh, just like, uh, you know, all work and no play uh, makes Jack a dull boy. So you see, our Buddha, uh, before he can become enlightened, uh, he met the previous Buddha, Kasapa, and then he probably attained uh, Sakadagamin. Uh. From there, he went to Tusita heaven, had a good rest, came back uh, and strove uh, until he attained enlightenment. <laughs> he, cannot be, he cannot be striving all the time, uh, <laughs> the only people uh, who are reborn in the Sutta Vasa heavens, uh, the pure abodes, uh, are Anagamins. Uh, Anagamins, uh, third fruit, Ariyala. And in the Suttas, the Buddha said uh, that to become an Anagamin, you have to get rid of the five lower factors. La. And uh, also you have got to have uh, four jhanas, la. at least four jhanas. La. Because the Sudhavasa heaven is in the fourth jhana plane. So because it is in the fourth jhana plane, unless you have obtained four jhanas, you cannot be reborn in the Sudhavasa heaven. Uh, and uh, normally to become an Arya, you need two basic things. La. One is a high concentration. Samadhi. Uh. The other one uh, is vipassana, meaning uh, contemplation of the Dhamma, uh, understanding the Dhamma. Uh. If you don't understand the Dhamma, you cannot be an Arya. Uh. When you understand the Dhamma, then with a clear mind, uh, that clear mind is, uh, determines uh, what, what level of Aryahood you attain. Uh. If a person without uh, jhana or without four jhana, when he listens to the Dhamma, he might become a uh, Sotapanna or he might become a Sakadagamin. But he cannot become an Anagamin or Arahan. Uh, but a person who has the four jhanas uh, or higher, uh, Arupas, uh, when he listens to the same Dhamma, he will either become an uh, Anagamin or an Arahan. When we sit down to meditate, uh, we should always uh, practice uh, samatha, samatha, which is one pointedness of mind. And this practice of samatha, if you look into the suttas, uh, is synonymous uh, with satipatthana, not like what nowadays some monks say. Uh, remember that day we read the Anapanasati Sutta, where the Buddha says, uh, if you practice Anapanasati, uh, uh, you develop fully uh, Anapanasati, and you, uh, you, you are practicing Satipatthana. Uh, it fulfills the four Satipatthana. Uh, uh. So, in uh, liberation, uh, the Buddha says, uh, that uh, you have to practice all the eight factors uh, of the Noble Eightfold Path. In some other sutta, the Buddha also says uh, that to become liberated, uh, samatha and vipassana are necessary. Uh, and samatha uh, will lead you to the four jhanas. Vipassana means contemplation. Uh, and this vipassana is the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, samasati. Samasati is contemplation of body, feelings, mind, and dhamma. And in the suttas, uh, the Buddha mentioned, out of these four objects of sati, uh, the most important is dhamma. Why? 
because there are five occasions of liberation now. Five occasions when a person becomes an arahant. And out of the five, uh, four have to do with the Dhamma. Listening to the Dhamma, one becomes liberated. Teaching the Dhamma also, one can become liberated. Repeating the Dhamma, one can also become liberated. Uh, reflecting on the Dhamma, one also can become liberated. So, uh, that's why Dhamma, contemplation of Dhamma is the most important of these four objects. Uh, so, the, when you want to practice uh, Samatha, it is only sitting posture uh, you can practice Samatha. Because uh, to attain the jhanas, uh, you must sit down with your eyes closed. Don't pay attention to sight, sound, taste, the five uh, senses, uh, seeing, hearing, smelling, taste and touch. Uh. Then only you can attain the jhanas. Whereas contemplation, you can do in any posture. You sit also you can contemplate, you stand also you can contemplate, you walk also you can contemplate, you lie down also you can contemplate. So why should you practice uh, vipassana, uh, contemplation, uh, when you are sitting down? Sitting down is the only occasion uh, you can practice samatha. So when you are sitting down, you should practice samatha and samatha only. But when you are not sitting down, any other posture, uh, you can practice vipassana. Generally, uh, you find in the, in the suttas uh, how the arahants attain enlightenment. Uh, is they try very hard uh, to attain jhana. At the same time, they are listening to the Dhamma. Uh, at the same time, they are listening to the discourses of the Buddha. And when they have perfected four jhanas, uh, they listen to the same sutta and uh, they become enlightened. Just like Sariputta, he, after coming to be a disciple of the Buddha, he strove uh, and uh, after two weeks, uh, he attained all the jhanas. Uh. And then one day he was fanning the Buddha, and the Buddha was talking with an external ascetic. Uh. So he was fanning the Buddha and listening to the Buddha talking. And he understood what the, the, the Dhamma that the Buddha was teaching, and he became an Arahant. Uh. So that is Vipassana, listening to the Dhamma, contemplating the Dhamma. When you listen, uh, you automatically you contemplate. Uh. Uh. When you are teaching also, you automatically you contemplate. When you are repeating also, you contemplate. When you reflect also, you contemplate. So all this is Vipassana. So always remember, uh, since sitting uh, is the only occasion uh, that you can practice Samatha, and Samatha is essential. Uh, uh, we read earlier uh, one Sutta where the Buddha said uh, to become a uh, Sotapanna, your mind uh, must also be rid of the five hindrances. Uh, if your mind is rid of the five hindrances, uh, then you can attain Sotapanna much easier. Uh, much easier. Uh. So this jhanas uh, helps us uh, to attain the various stages of Aryahood. Uh, uh, speeds up uh, the process of attaining the stages of Aryahood uh, much faster. So in the spiritual practice, uh, two things I always say uh, is very important. One, you sharpen your mind uh, by practicing Samatha every day. The other one, you either you listen to the CDs uh, on the Nikayas, the Suttas, or you can study the books uh, on the Suttas. Uh. So as you are sharpening your mind and you are studying the Suttas, uh, these two, uh, uh, well, once you understand the Suttas, uh, you become an Arya. The suttas uh, are the fastest way uh, for you to understand the Dhamma. That is why the Buddha took so much effort uh, to talk uh, on 5,000 suttas. If, if just by contemplation by yourself, uh, uh, it is, uh, you, you can achieve, uh, then the Buddha would not have spoken so many suttas. Uh, the Buddha's words uh, are so direct. Uh, when we listen to his words uh, and we just contemplate on his words, uh, we can understand uh, much faster uh, than you were to contemplate on yourself, on your own. Parami. Parami. 
This paramisa, if you look into the suttas, the earliest discourses of the Buddha, is never mentioned. Uh, this paramis developed later because they, instead of talking about the Arahan path, uh, later books, uh, especially the Mahayana books, uh, they talk about the Bodhisattva path. And then uh, they discourage people uh, from practicing the spiritual path. They say if you practice the spiritual path, you are a selfish fellow. You should help all beings in the world. Have a big heart, nah? be a bodhisattva, and help all beings. And then the one way nah, to discourage you from practicing nah, the spiritual path, nah, they say nah, to become enlightened, it takes four asankhya kapas and 100 maha kapas. And then they use the Jataka stories uh, to say uh, that the Buddha developed the Paramis uh, over a long time. Uh, so long, uh, they say, four Asankhya Kappas and 100 Maha Kappas, which basically means eternity. Uh, because one Kappa is an uncountable length of time. One Kappa, one, one world cycle, basically. Uh. So, no, one Asankhya Kappa. An Asankhya Kappa is an uncountable number of world cycles. Uh, so, they use the Jataka stories uh, to say that the Buddha practiced the Paramis. But when we look into the Jataka stories, uh, we find uh, they are childish stories. Uh, they cannot be uh, true. Uh, why? Because they say the Bodhisattva in the past life uh, was a deer or a rabbit. Uh, and in these stories, uh, you find the animals can talk. Uh, animals cannot talk, but in these stories, uh, animals can talk and they behave uh, uh, smarter uh, than many human beings. Uh, they talk about the, the rabbit or the hare uh, sacrificing its body for the hunter to eat, which is ridiculous. Uh, and then like Vesantara Jataka, uh, they talk about the Bodhisattva uh, as a human being. Uh, to cultivate the parami of giving uh, or generosity. Uh, he gave away the wife and his two children uh, to a heartless beggar. Uh, he knows uh, this heartless beggar is going to torture his wife and his children. And yet, uh, with tears in his eyes, uh, he gave away the wife and children to be tortured. That is extremely selfish. Uh, just because you want to cultivate the parami, you make your wife and your children suffer for you. Uh, so this uh, goes against the Dhamma. Because in the Dhamma, the Buddha says, uh, a good man or a wise man's uh, dana or uh, offering uh, must not harm himself, must not harm others. So that being the case, uh, there's no possibility uh, that the Bodhisattva uh, will practice uh, like this Vesantara Jataka. Uh, it's logical uh, if you give your wife and your children uh, to a rich, very, very rich man uh, so that they have a good life. Why do you give to a heartless beggar? Huh? You know they're going to suffer. Uh, also, the other Jataka story uh, about the Bodhisattva, he saw this uh, uh, tigress, uh, uh, hungry, no milk to give the cubs. Uh, so he committed suicide, uh, jumped from the top of the hill, uh, uh, killed himself uh, so that he can feed the tiger. This again contradicts the Dhamma. You're harming yourself. Uh, doing charity by harming yourself this is illogical. If you tell that to some people in other religions, uh, they laugh at you. Uh, the Buddhists are stupid. Uh, can believe such stories. Yeah, I think Buddhists are stupid uh, if they believe such stories. So this paramis uh, is just a device uh, to get you uh, not to practice the, the Noble Eightfold Path. That's why they say there are 84,000 Dharma doors. There are no 84,000 Dharma doors. There's only one Dharma door taught by the Buddha, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. When you practice the Paramis, all these Paramis are worldly qualities. Worldly qualities does not get you out of samsara. That's enough. Six Paramis by the Mahayanis and ten Paramis by the Theravadans. If you listen to my talk uh, on early Buddhism in India, uh, you realize uh, that Buddhism after 500 years uh, developed into Mahayana and Hinayana. And a few hundred years later, uh, Mahayana and Hinayana merge together. They accept, begin to accept each other's teaching. So these people supposed to be Theravadans, uh, they start to accept the Bodhisattva path. 
That's why they, they instead of six paramis, they talk about ten paramis. And then these uh, Mahayanis start to accept the what they call the Hinayana Sutras. But in in the few hundred years that elapsed, uh, they lost all their their Pali Suttas. So they started to look for the Pali Suttas again, and they had to recover uh, what they call the Agama Sutras uh, from various schools, Dhamma Gupta School and Kavasti Vardin School and one of the Nikayas, I think the Angutra Nikaya, they don't even know where they got it from. And those, uh, these uh, Agama Sutras uh, are incomplete. So, it just shows uh, they, they lost uh, their thing. So, you have to study the, the, the history uh, to understand uh, what happened. If all the Buddhist schools are looking at this and they do dispute this with their original discourse of the Buddhist, if they agree on that and then now they have introduced new ones that contradict the earlier sutras, is it the same? You, 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 I think you didn't listen to my talk properly. Now, after so many years, now only people realize that the Pali Suttas are the original Suttas. Years ago, a few hundred years ago, some of them said they don't want to accept the Buddha's Suttas, so they create new Suttas. This happened several hundred years ago. It's not now. Okay, shall we end here?